Okay, postmodern mythology. We've made it through the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars to the Congress of Vienna. Map the national boundaries within Europe set by the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna of 1814 to 15 was one of the most important international conferences in European history. It remade Europe after the downfall of the French Emperor Napoleon I. It was a meeting of ambassadors of European states chaired by Austrian statesman Clemens von Metternich and held in Vienna from November 1814 to June 1815. The objective of the Congress was to provide a long-term peace plan for Europe by settling crit critical issues arising from the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. The goal was not simply to restore old boundaries, but to resize the main powers so they could balance each other and remain at peace. The leaders were conservatives with little use for republicanism or revolution, both of which threatened to upset the status quo in Europe. France lost all its recent conquests, while Prussia, Austria and Russia made major territorial gains. Prussia added smaller German states in the West, Swedish Pomerania and 60% of the Kingdom of Saxony. Austria gained Venice and much of Northern Italy. Russia gained parts of Poland. The new Kingdom of the Netherlands had been created just months before and included formerly Austra Austrian territory that in 1830 became Belgium. Picture frontispiece of the Acts of the Congress of Vienna. The immediate background was Napoleonic France's defeat and surrender in May 1814, which brought an end to 23 years of nearly continuous war. Negotiations continued despite the outbreak of fighting triggered by Napoleon's dramatic return from exile and resumption of power in France during the 100 days of March to July 1815. The Congress's final act was signed nine days before his final defeat at Waterloo on 18th of June 1815. Liberal historians have criticised the Congress for causing the subsequent suppression of the emerging national and liberal movements, and it has been seen as a reactionary movement for the benefit of traditional monarchs. However, others praise it for having created relatively long-term stability and peaceful conditions in most of Europe. In a technical sense, the Congress of Vienna was not properly a Congress. It never met in plenary session, and most of the discussions occurred in informal face-to-face -face sessions among the great powers of Austria, Britain, France, Russia, and sometimes Prussia, with limited or no participation by other delegates. On the other hand, the Congress was the first occasion in history where, on a continental scale, national representatives came together to formulate treaties instead of relying mostly on messages among the several capitals. The Congress of Vienna settlement, despite later changes, formed the framework for European international politics until the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. Preliminaries the treatment of Chaumont in 1814 had reaffirmed decisions that had been made already and that would be ratified by the more important Congress of Vienna of 1814 to 15. They included the establishment of a confederated Germany, the division of Italy into inde independent states, the restoration of the Bourbon kings of Spain, and the enlargement of the Netherlands to include what in 1830 became modern Belgium. The Treaty of Chaumont became the cornerstone of European alliance that formed the balance of power for decades. Other partial settlements had already occurred at the Treaty of Paris between France and the Sixth Coalition and the Treaty of Kiel that covered issues raised regarding Scandinavia. The Treaty of Paris had determined that a general congress should be held in Vienna and that invitations would be issued to all the powers engaged on either side in the present war. The opening was scheduled for July 1814. Participants. So, there's a picture here of the participants. And 23 
listed. Arthur Wellesley, First Duke of Wellington. Joachim Lobo Silviera, Seventh Count of Oriolo. Antonio di Saldana di Gama, Count of Porto Santo. Count Karl Lohenhelm. Jean-Louis Paul Francois, Fifth Duke of Noailles. Clemens Wenzel, Prince von Metternich. André Dupin, Count Karl Robert Nesselrode. Pedro de Sousa Holstein, First Count of Palmela. Robert Stewart, Viscount Castlereagh. Emmerich Joseph, Duke of Dalberg. Baron Johann von Wessenberg. Prince Andrei Krilovich Razumovsky. Charles Stewart, first Baron Stewart. Pedro Gomez Labrador, Marquis of Labrador. Richard Lepoa Trench, second Earl of Clancarty. Nikolaus von Wacken, recorder. Friedrich von Gentz, Congress Secretary. Baron Wilhelm von Humboldt. William Cathcart, 1st Earl of Cathcart. Prince Karl August von Hardenberg. Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord. Count Gustav Ernst von Stackelberg. The Congress functioned through formal meetings such as working groups and official diplomatic functions. However, a large portion of the Congress was conducted informally at salons, banquets and balls. Four Great Powers and Bourbon France. Warning, this section needs additional citations for verification. The Four Great Powers had previously formed the core of the Sixth Coalition. On the verge of Napoleon's defeat, they had outlined their common position in the Treaty of Chaumont, March 1814, and negotiated the Treaty of Paris, 1814, with the Bourbons during their restoration. Austria was represented by Prince Metternich, the foreign minister and by his deputy Baron Johann von Wessenberg as the Congress's sessions were in Vienna, Emperor Francis was kept closely informed. Britain was represented first by its foreign secretary Viscount Castlereagh, then by the Duke of Wellington after Castlereagh's return to England in February 1815. In the last weeks it was headed by the Earl of Clancarty and after Wellington left to face Napoleon during the Hundred Days. Tsar Alexander I controlled the Russian delegation, which was formally led by the Foreign Minister Count Karl Robert Nesselrode. The Tsar had two main goals, to gain control of Poland and to promote the peaceful coexistence of European nations. He succeeded in forming the Holy Alliance, 1815, based on monarchism and anti-secularism, and formed to combat any threat of revolution or republicanism. Prussia was represented by Prince Karl August von Hardenberg, the Chancellor and the diplomat and scholar of Wilhelm von Humboldt. King Frederick William III of Prussia was also in Vienna, playing his role behind the scenes. France, the fifth power, was represented by its foreign minister Talleyrand, as well as the minister plenipotentiary, the Duke of Dalberg. Talleyrand had already negotiated the Treaty of Paris 1814, for Louis XVIII of France. The king, however, distrusted him and was also secretly negotiating with Metternich by mail. Other signatories of the Treaty of Paris, 1814. These parties had not been part of the Chaumont Agreement but had joined the Treaty of Paris, 1814. Spain, Marquis Pedro Gomez de Labrador. Portugal, plenipotentiaries Pedro de Sousa Holstein, Count of Palmela, Antonio de Saldana. De Gama, Count of Porto Santo, Joachim Lobo da Silveira, Sweden, Count Karl Lohenhelm, others, Denmark, Count Niels Rogenkrauts, Foreign Minister, King Frederick VI was also present in Vienna, the Netherlands, Earl of Clancarty, the British Ambassador at the Dutch Court, and Baron Hans von Gagen. Switzerland, every canton had its own delegation, Charles Pictet de Rochemont from Geneva played a prominent role. Kingdom of Sardinia, Marquis Filippo Antonio Asinari di San Marzano. The Papal States, Cardinal Ercole Consalvi. Republic of Genoa, Marquis 
Agostino Pareto, Senator of the Republic. Grand Duke of Tuscany, Neri Corsini. On German issues, Bavaria, Maximilian Graf Mont von Montgelas. Württemberg, George Ernst Levin von Wintzingerold. Hanover, then in the personal union with the British Crown, George Graf zu Münster, King George III, had refused to recognise the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806 and maintained a separate diplomatic staff as elector of Hanover to conduct the affairs of the family estate, the Duke of brunswick Lüneburg, until the results of the Congress were concluded establishing the Kingdom of Hanover. Mecklenburg-Schwerin, Leopold von Plessen. Virtually every state in Europe had a delegation in Vienna. More than 200 states and princely houses were represented at the Congress. In addition, there were representatives of cities, corporations, religious organizations, for instance, abbeys, and special interest groups, e.g. a delegation representing German publishers demanding a copyright law and freedom of the press. The Congress was noted for its lavish entertainment, According to a famous joke, it did not move, but it danced. Talleyrand's role, painting of Talleyrand, proved an able negotiator for the defeated French. Initially, the representatives of the four victorious powers hoped to exclude the French from serious participation in the negotiations, but Talleyrand skillfully managed to insert himself into her inner councils in the first weeks of negotiations. He allied himself to a committee of eight lesser powers, including Spain, Sweden and Portugal, to control the negotiations. Once Talleyrand was able to use this committee to make himself a part of the inner negotiations, he then left it, once again abandoning his allies. The major allies' indecision on how to conduct their affairs without provoking a united protest from the lesser powers led to the calling of a preliminary conference on protocol to which Talleyrand and the Marquis of Labrador Spain's representative were invited on 30th of September, 1814. Congress Secretary Friedrich von Gentz reported the intervention of Talleyrand and Labrador has hopelessly upset all our plans. Talleyrand protested against the procedure we have adopted and soundly berated us for two hours. It was a scene I shall never forget. The embarrassed representatives of the Allies replied that the document concerning the protocol they had arranged actually meant nothing. If it means so little, why did you sign it? snapped Labrador. Talleyrand's policy, directed as much by national as personal ambitions, demanded the close but by no means amicable relationship he had with Labrador, whom Talleyrand regarded with disdain. Labrador later remarked of Talleyrand that that cripple, unfortunately, is going to Vienna. Talleyrand skirted additional articles suggested by Labrador. He had no intention of handing over the 12,000 Afrancesados, Spanish fugitives sympathetic to France, who had sworn fealty to Joseph Bonaparte, nor the bulk of the documents, paintings, pieces of fine art and books that had been looted from the archives, palaces, churches and cathedrals of Spain. Polish-Saxon crisis. The most dangerous topic at the Congress was the so-called Polish-Saxon crisis. Russia wanted most of Poland and Prussia wanted all of Saxony, whose king had allied with Napoleon. The Tsar would become king of Poland. Austria was fearful this would make Russia much too powerful, a view which was supported by Britain. The result was deadlock, for which Talleyrand proposed a solution. Admit France to the inner circle and France would support Austria and Britain. The three nations signed a secret treaty on the 3rd of January 1815, agreeing to go to war against Russia and Prussia, if necessary, to prevent the Russo-Prussian plan from coming to fruition. When the Tsar heard of the secret treaty, he agreed to a compromise that satisfied all parties on 24th of October 1815. Russia received most of the Napoleonic Duchy of Warsaw as a kingdom of Poland called Congress Poland, with the Tsar as king ruling it independently of Russia. Russia, however, did not receive the province of Posen, Poznan, which was given to Prussia as the Grand Duchy of Posen, nor Krakow, which became a free city. Furthermore, the Tsar was unable to unite the new domain with the parts of Poland that had been incorporated into Russia in the 1790s. Prussia received 60% of Saxony, later known as Province of Saxony. 
with the remainder returned to King Frederick Augustus I at his kingdom of Saxony. The final act, map, territories leapt to France in 1814, but removed after the Treaty of Paris in pink. The final act, embodying all the separate treaties, was signed on the 9th of June 1815, a few days before the Battle of Waterloo. Its provisions included Russia was given most of the Duchy of Warsaw, Poland, and was allowed to keep Finland, which it had annexed from Sweden in 1809 and held until 1917. Prussia was given three-fifths of Saxony, parts of the Duchy of Warsaw, the Grand Duchy of Posen, Danzig, and the Rhineland slash Westphalia. A German confederation of 39 states was created from the previous 300 of the Holy Roman Empire under the presidency of the Austrian Emperor. Emperor. Only portions of the territory of Austria and Prussia were included in the confederation, roughly the same portions that had been within the Holy Roman Empire. The Netherlands and the Southern Netherlands, approximately modern-day Belgium, were united in a monarchy, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, with the House of Orange-Nassau providing the King the Eight Articles of London. To compensate for the Orange-Nassau's loss of the Nassau lands to Prussia, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands and the Grand Duke of Luxembourg were to form a personal union under the House of Orange-Nassau, with Luxembourg but not the Netherlands inside the German Confederation. Swedish Pomerania, given to Denmark a year earlier in return for Norway, was ceded by Denmark to Prussia. France received back Guadalupe from Sweden in return for yearly instalments to the Swedish king. The neutrality of the 22 cantons of Switzerland was guaranteed and a federal pact was recommended to them in strong terms. Bien and the Prince Bishopric of Basel were incorporated into the canton of Bern. The Congress also suggested a number of compromises for territorial disputes between cantons to be resolved. Hanover gave up the Duchy of Lauenburg to Denmark, but was enlarged by the addition of former territories of the Bishop of Münster and the formerly Prussian East Frisia, and made a kingdom. Most of the territorial gains of Bavaria, Württemberg, Baden, Hesse, Darmstadt and Nassau under the mediatizations of 1801 to 1806 were recognised. Bavaria also gained control of the Rhenish, Rhenish Palatinate and parts of the Napoleonic Duke of Würzburg and Grand Duke of Frankfurt. Hesse Darmstadt, in exchange for giving up the Duke of Westphalia to Prussia, received Rhenish Hesse with its capital at Mainz. Austria regained control of the Tyrol and Salzburg of the former Illyrian provinces of Tarnopol district from Russia, received Lombardy, Venetia in Italy, and Ragusa in Dalmatia. Former Austrian territory in southwest Germany remained under the control of Württemberg and Baden, and the Austrian Netherlands were also not recovered. Ferdinand III was restored as Grand Duke of Tuscany. Archduke Francis IV was acknowledged as a ruler of the Duchy of Modena, Reggio and Mirandola. The Papal States were under the rule of the Pope and restored to their former extent, with the exception of Avignon and the Comtat Venaissin, which remained part of France. Britain was confirmed in control of the Cape Colony in South, Southern Africa, Tobago, Ceylon and various other colonies in Africa and Asia. Other colonies, most notably the Dutch East Indies and Martinique, were restored to their previous overlords. The King of Sardinia was restored in Piedmont, Nice and Savoy and was given control of Genoa, putting an end to the brief proclamation of a restored republic. The Dukes of Parma, Piacenza and Gostala were taken from the Queen of Etruria and given to Marie-Louise for her lifetime. The Duchy of Lucca was created for the House of Bourbon Parma, which would have reversionary rights to Parma after the death of Marie-Louise. The Bourbon Ferdinand IV, King of Sicily, was restored to control the King of Naples after Joachim Murat, the king installed by Bonaparte, supported the Napoleon in the Hundred Days and started the Neapolitan War by attacking Austria. The slave trade was condemned. 
Freedom of navigation was guaranteed for rivers, notably the Rhine and the Danube. The final act was signed by representatives of Austria, France, Portugal, Prussia, Russia, Sweden, Norway and Britain. Spain did not sign the treaty but ratified it in 1817. Other changes. Painting of Alexander I. Alexander I of Russia considered himself a guarantor of European security. The Congress's principal results, apart from its confirmation of France's loss of the territories annexed between 1795 to 1810, which had already been settled by the Treaty of Paris, were the enlargement of Russia, which gained most of the Duchy of Warsaw and Prussia, which acquired the district of Poznan, Swedish Pomerania, Westphalia and the northern Rhineland. The consolidation of Germany from nearly 300 states of the Holy Roman Empire dissolved in 1806 into a much less complex system of 39 states, four of which were free cities, was confirmed. These states form a loose German confederation under the leadership of Austria and Prussia. Representatives in Cong- at the Congress agreed to numerous other territorial changes. By the Treaty of Kiel, Norway had been ceded by the King of Denmark, Norway, to the King of Sweden. This sparked the nationalist movement which led to the establishment of, of the Kingdom of Norway on May 17, 1814, and the subsequent personal union with Sweden. Austria gained Lombardy, Venetia in northern Italy, while much of the rest of north-central Italy went to Habsburg dynasties, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, the Duke of Medina and the Duke of Parma. The Papal States were restored to the Pope. The Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia was restored to its mainland possessions and also gained control of the Republic of Genoa. In southern Italy, Napoleon's brother-in-law, Joachim Murat, was originally allowed to retain his Kingdom of Naples But his support of Napoleon in the Hundred Days led to the restoration of the Bourbon Ferdinand IV to the throne. A large United Kingdom of the Netherlands was formed for the Prince of Orange, including both the old United Provinces and formerly Austrian-ruled territories in the Southern Netherlands. Other less important territorial adjustments included significant territorial gains for the German kingdoms of Hanover, which gained East Frisia from Prussia, and various other territories in northwest Germany and Bavaria, which gained the Rhenish Palatinate and territories in Franconia. The Duchy of Lauenburg was transferred from Hanover to Denmark, and Prussia annexed Swedish Pomerania. Switzerland was enlarged and Swiss neutrality was established. Swiss mercenaries had played a significant role in European wars for a couple of hundred years. The Congress intended to put a stop to these activities permanently. During the wars, Portugal had lost its town of Olivenza to Spain and moved to have it restored. Portugal is historically Britain's oldest ally and with British support, succeeded in having the reincorporation of Olivenza decreed in the Article CV of the General Treaty of the Final Act, which stated the the powers recognising the justice of the claims of Portugal and the Brazils upon the town of Olivenza and the other trajectories ceded to Spain by the Treaty of Badios of 1801. Portugal ratified the Final Act in 1815, but Spain would not sign and this became the most important holdout against the Congress of Vienna. Deciding in the end that it was better to become part of Europe than to stand alone, Spain finally accepted the treaty on 7th of May 1817. However, Olivenza and its surroundings were never returned to Portuguese control, and this issue remains unsolved. Great Britain received parts of the West Indies at the expense of the Netherlands and Spain and kept the former Dutch colonies of Ceylon and the Cape Colony, as well as Malta and Heligoland. Under the Treaty of Paris 1814, Article 8, France ceded to Britain the islands of Tobago and St. Lucia and of the Isle of France and its dependencies, especially Rodriguez and Les Seychelles. And under the treaty between Great Britain and Austria, Prussia and Russia 
respecting the Ionian Islands signed in Paris on 5th of November 1815. As one of the treaties signed during the Peace of Paris 1815, Britain obtained a protectorate over the United States of the Ionian Islands. Later Criticism The Congress of Vienna has frequently been criticised by 19th century and more recent historians for ignoring national and liberal impulses and for imposing a stifling reaction on the continent. It was an integral part in what became known as the conservative order in which the democracy and civil rights associated with the American and French revolutions were de-emphasised. In the 20th century, however, many historians came to admire the statesmen at the Congress whose work prevented another widespread European war for nearly 100 years, 1815 to 1914. Among these is Henry Kissinger, who in 1954 wrote his doctoral dissertation, A World Restored, on it. Historian Mark Jarrett argues that the Congress of Vienna and the Congress system marked the true beginning of our modern era. He says the Congress system was the deliberate conflict management and was the first genuine attempt to create an international order based upon consensus rather than conflict. Europe was ready, Jarrett states, to accept an unprecedented degree of internal international co cooperation in response to the French Revolution. Historian Paul Schroeder argues that the old formula for balance of power were in fact highly destabilizing and predatory. He says the Congress of Vienna avoided them and instead set up rules that produced a stable and benign equilibrium. The Congress of Vienna was the first of a series of international meetings that came to be known as the Concert of Europe, which was an attempt to forge a peaceful balance of power in Europe. It served as a model for later organizations such as the League of Nations in 1919 and the United Nations in 1945. Before the opening of the Paris Peace Conference of 1918, the British Foreign Office commissioned a history of the Congress of Vienna to serve an ex as an example to its own delegates of how to achieve an equally successful peace. Besides the main decisions of the Congress were made by the four great powers and not all the countries of Europe could extend their rights at the Congress. The Italian peninsula became a mere geographical expression as divided into seven parts, Lombardy, Venetia, Modena, Naples, Sicily, Parma, Piedmont, Sardinia, Tuscany and the Papal States, under the control of different powers. Poland remained partitioned between Russia, Prussia and Austria, with the largest part the newly created Kingdom of Poland, remaining under Russian control. The arrangements made by the four great powers sought to ensure future disputes would be settled in a manner that would avoid the terrible wars of the previous 20 years. Although the Congress of Vienna preserved the balance of power in Europe, it could not check the spread of revolutionary movements across the continent some 30 years later. And that leads to the revolutions of 1848. So, I wanted to cover the revolutions of 1848, so this might be a good, good time to do it. The revolutions of 1848, known in some countries as the springtime of the peoples or the spring of nations, were a series of political upheavals throughout Europe in 1848. It remains the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history. Painting, barricade on the Rue Soufflot, an 1848 painting by Horace Vernet, the Pantheon is shown in the background. And this is a, a part of the Age of Revolution series on Wikipedia. So also known as Spring of Nations, Springtime of the People's Year of Revolution. Participants, people of France, the German states, the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Hungary, the Italian states, Denmark, Wallachia, Poland and others outcome little political change and significant social and cultural change. The revolutions were essentially bourgeois revolutions, democratic and liberal in nature, 
with the aim of removing the old monarchical structures and creating independent nation-states. The revolution spread across Europe after an initial revolution began in France in February. Over 50 countries were affected, but with no significant coordination or cooperation among their respective revolutionaries. Some of the major contributing factors were widespread dissatisfaction with political leadership, demands for more participation in government and democracy, demands for freedom of the press, other demands made by the working class, the upsurge of nationalism and the regrouping of established government forces. The uprisings were led by ad hoc coalitions of reformers, the middle classes and workers, which did not hold together for long. Many of the revolutions were quickly suppressed. Tens of thousands of people were killed and many more were forced into exile. Significant lasting reforms included the abolition of serfdom in Austria and Hungary, the end of absolute monarchy in Denmark, and the introduction of representative democracy in the Netherlands. The revolutions were most important in France, the Netherlands, Italy, the Austrian Empire, and the states of the German Confederation that would make up the German Empire in the late 19th and early 20th century. Origins Map of Europe in 1848, depicting the main revolutionary centres, important counter-revolutionary troop movements, and states with abdications. The revolutions arose from such a wide variety of causes that it is difficult to view them as resulting from a coherent movement or set of social phenomena. Numerous changes have been taking place in European society throughout the first half of the 19th century. Both liberal reformers and radical politicians were reshaping national governments. Technological change was revolutionising the life of the working classes. A popular press extended political awareness and new values and ideas such as popular liberalism, nationalism and socialism began to emerge. Some historians emphasise the serious crop failures particularly those of 1846 that produced hardship among peasants and the working urban poor. Large swaths of nobility were discontented with royal absolutism or near absolutism. In 1846, there had been an uprising of Polish nobility in Austrian Galicia, which was only counted when peasants in turn rose up against the nobles. Additionally, an uprising by democratic forces against Prussia planned but not actually carried out, occurred in Greater Poland. Next, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, working in Brussels, had written the Communist Manifesto, published in German in London on 21st of February 1848, at the request of the Communist League, an organisation consisting principally of German workers. Following the March insurrection in Berlin, they began agitating in Germany. They issued their demands of the Communist Party in Germany from Paris in March. The pamphlet urged unification of Germany, universal suffrage, abolition of feudal duties and similar middle class goals. The middle and working classes thus shared a desire for reform and agreed on many of the specific aims. Their participations in the revolutions, however, differed. While much of the impetus came from the middle classes, much of the cannon fodder came from the lower classes. The re revolts first erupted in the cities. Urban Workers Painting of Galician Slaughter by Jan Jan Lewicki Depicting the massacre of Polish nobles by Polish peasants in Galicia in 1846. The population in French rural areas had risen rapidly, causing many peasants to seek a living in the cities. Many in the bourgeoisie feared and distanced themselves from the working poor. Many unschooled labourers toiled from 12 to 15 hours per day when they had work, living in squalid, disease-ridden slums. Traditional artisans felt the pressure of industrialization, having lost their guilds. Revolutionaries such as Karl Marx built up a following. The liberalisation of trade laws and the growth of factories had increased the gulf among master tradesmen and journeymen and apprentices whose numbers increased disproportionately by 93% from 
1815 to 1848 in Germany. Significant proletarian unrest had occurred in Lyon in 1831 and 1834 and Prague in 1844. Jonathan Sperber has suggested that in the period after 1825, poorer urban workers, particularly day labourers, factory workers and artisans, saw their purchasing power decline relatively steeply. Urban meat consumption in Belgium, France and Germany stagnated or declined after 1830 despite growing populations. The economic panic of 1847 increased urban unemployment. 10,000 Viennese factory workers were made redundant and 128 Hamburg firms went bankrupt over the course of 1847. With the, with the exception of the Netherlands, there was a strong correlation among the countries that were most deeply affected by the industrial shock of 1847 and those that underwent a revolution in 1848. The situation in the German states was similar. Parts of Prussia were beginning to industrialise. During the decade of the 1840s, mechanised production in the textile industry brought about inexpensive clothing that undercut the handmade products of German tailors. Reforms ameliorated the most unpopular features of rural feudalism, but industrial workers remained dissatisfied with these and pressed for greater change. Urban workers had no choice but to spend half their income on food, which consisted mostly of bread and potatoes. As a result of harvest failures, food prices soared and the demand for manufactured goods decreased, causing an increase in unemployment. During the revolution to address the problem of unemployment, workshops were organised for men interested in construction work. Officials also set up workshops for women when they felt they were excluded Artisans and unemployed workers destroyed industrial machines when they threatened to give employers more power over them. Rural areas. Rural population growth had led to food shortages, land pressure and migration both within and from Europe, especially to the Americas. Peasant discontent in the 1840s grew in intensity. Peasant occupations of lost communal land increased in many areas. Those convicted of wood theft in the Rhenish Palatinate increased from 100,000 in 1829 to 30 to 185,000 in 1846 to 47. In the years 1845 and 1846, a potato blight caused a subsistence crisis in Northern Europe and encouraged the raiding of manorial potato stocks in Silesia in 1847. The effects of the blight were most severely manifested in the Great Irish Famine, but also caused famine-like conditions in the Scottish Highlands and throughout continental Europe. Harvests of rye in the Rhineland were 20% of previous levels, while the Czech potato harvest was reduced by a half. These reduced harvests were accompanied by steep price rise. The cost of wheat more than doubled in France and Habsburg, Italy. There were 400 French food riots during 1846 to 47, while German socio-economic protests increased from 28 during 1830 to 1839 to 103 during 1840 to 47. Central to long-term peasant grievances were the loss of communal lands, forest restrictions, such as the French Forest Code of 1827, and remaining feudal structures, notably the robot labour obligations, that existed among the serfs and oppressed peasantry of the Habsburg lands. Aristocratic wealth and corresponding power was synonymous with the ownership of farmlands and effective control over the peasants. Peasant grievances exploded during the revolutionary year of 1848, yet, yet were often disconnected from urban revolutionary movements. The revolutionary Sandor Petoffi's popular nationalist rhetoric in Budapest did not translate into any success with the Magyar peasantry, while the Viennese Democrat Hans Kudlich reported that his efforts to galvanise the Austrian peasantry had disappeared in the great sea of indifference and phlegm. Role of ideas. Drawing of the June uprising of 1848 in Prague injected a strong political element into Czech national revival. Despite forceful and often violent efforts of established and reactionary powers to keep 
them down, disruptive ideas gained popularity. Democracy, liberalism, radicalism, nationalism and socialism. They demanded a constitution, universal manhood suffrage, press freedom, freedom of expression and other democratic rights. The establishment of civilian militia, liberation of peasants, liberalisation of the economy, abolition of tariff barriers and the abolition of monarchical power structures in favour of the establishment of republican states, or at least the restriction of the prince power in the form of constitutional monarchies. In the language of the 1840s, democracy meant replacing an electorate of property owners with universal male suffrage. Liberalism fundamentally meant consent of the governed, restriction of church and state power, republican government, freedom of the press and the individual. The 1840s had seen the emergence of radical liberal publications such as Rheinische Zeitung, Le National and La Reforme in France, Ignaz Caranda's Grenzboten in Austria, Lajos Kossuth's Pesti Herlap in Hungary, as well as the increased popularity of the older Morgenbladet in Norway and the Aftonbladet in Sweden. Nationalism believed in uniting people bound by some mix of common languages, culture, religion, shared history and, of course, immediate geography. There were also irredentist movements. Nationalism had developed a broader appeal during the pre-1848 period as seen in the František Palacki's 1836 History of the Czech Nation which emphasised a national lineage of conflict with the Germans or the popular patriotic Liedergrand's song circles that were held across Germany. Patriotic and belligerent songs about Schleswig had dominated the Wurzburg National Song Festival in 1845. Socialism in the 1840s was a term without a consensus definition, meaning different things to different people, but was typically used within a context of more power for workers in a system based on worker ownership of the means of production. These concepts together, democracy, liberalism, nationalism and socialism, in the sense described above, came to be encapsulated in the political term, radicalism. Sequence of main trends. Every country had a distinctive timing, but the general pattern showed very sharp cycles as reform moved up, then down. Spring 1848, astonishing success. Painting of the revolutionary barricades in Vienna in May 1848. The world was astonished in spring 1848 when revolutions appeared in so many places and seemed on the verge of success everywhere. Agitators who had been exiled by the old governments rushed home to seize the moment. In France, the monarchy was overthrown and replaced by a republic. In a number of major German and Italian states and in Austria, the old leaders were forced to grant liberal constitutions. The Italian and German states seemed to be rapidly forming united, unified nations. Austria gave Hungarians and Czechs liberal grants of autonomy and national status. Summer 1848. Divisions among reformers. In France, bloody street battles exploded between the middle class reformers and the working class radicals. German reformers argued endlessly without finalising their results. Fall of 1848. Reactionaries organised for a counter-revolution. Caught off guard at first, the aristocracy and their allies plot a return to power. 1849 to 1851. Overthrow of revolutionary regimes. The revolutions suffer a series of defeats in summer 1849. Reactionaries returned to power and many leaders of the revolution went into exile. Some social reforms proved permanent and years later, nationalists in Germany, Italy and Hungary gained their objectives. Events by country or region. Italian states. Painting. Episode from the Five Days of Milan. Painting by Baldassare Verazzi. 
Although little notice at the time, the little noticed at the time, the first major outbreak came in Sicily, starting in January 1848. There had been several previous revolts against Bourbon rule. This one produced an independent state that lasted only 16 months before the Bourbons came back. During those months, the constitution was quite advanced for its time in liberal democratic terms, as was the proposal of an Italian confederation of states. The result, the revolt's failure was reversed 12 years later as the Bourbon kingdom of the two Sicilies collapsed in 1860 to 1861 with the Risorgimento. France. The February Revolution in France was sparked by the suppression of the Campagne de Banquets. This revolution was driven by nationalist and republican ideals among the French general public, who believed the people should rule themselves. It ended the constitutional monarchy of Louis-Philippe and led to the creation of the French Second Republic. This government was headed by Louis-Napoleon, who in 1852 staged a coup d'etat and established himself as dictatorial emperor of the Second French Empire. Alexis de Tocqueville remarked in his recollections of the period, society was cut in two, those who had nothing united in common envy and those who had anything united in common terror. German states. Painting, revolutionaries in Berlin in March 1848, waving the revolutionary flags. The March Revolution in the German states took place in the south and the west of Germany with large popular assemblies and mass demonstrations led by well-educated students and intellectuals. They demanded German national unity, freedom of the press and freedom of assembly. The uprisings were poorly coordinated but had in common a rejection of traditional autocratic political structures in the 39 independent states of the German Confederation. The middle class and working class components of the revolution split and in the end, the conservative aristocracy defeated it, forcing many liberals into exile. Denmark. Painting of Danish soldiers parade through Copenhagen in 1849 after victories in the First Schleswig War. Denmark had been governed by a system of absolute monarchy since the 17th century. King Christian VIII, a moderate reformer but still an absolutist, died in January 1848 during a period of rising opposition from farmers and liberals. The demand for constitutional monarchy led by the national liberals ended with a popular march to Christiansborg on 21st of March. The new king, Frederick VII, met the liberals' demands and installed a new cabinet that included prominent leaders of the National Liberal Party. The National Liberal Movement was wanted to abolish absolutism but retain a strongly centralised state. The King accepted a new constitution agreeing to share power with a bicameral parliament called the Riksdag. It is said that the Danish King's first words after signing away his absolute power were, that was nice, now I can sleep in the mornings. Although army officers were dissatisfied, they accepted the new arrangement which, in contrast to the rest of Europe, was not overturned by reactionaries. The Liberal Constitution did not extend to Schleswig, leaving the Schleswig-Holstein question unanswered. Schleswig. The Duchy of Schleswig, a region containing both Danes, a North Germanic population, and Germans, a West Germanic population, was a part of the Danish monarchy, but remained a duchy separate from the Kingdom of Denmark. Spurred by pan-German sentiment, the Germans of Schleswig took up arms to protest a new policy announced by Denmark's national liberal government, which would have fully integrated the duchy into Denmark. The German population in Schleswig and Holstein revolted, inspired by the Protestant clergy. The German state sent in an army, but Danish victories in 1849 led to the Treaty of Berlin 1850, and the London Protocol, 1852. They reaffirmed the sovereignty of the King of Denmark while prohibiting union with Denmark. The violation of the latter provision led to renewed warfare in 1863 and the Prussian victory in 1864. 
The Habsburg Monarchy, painting the proclamation of the Serbian Vojvodina in May 1848. From March 1848 through July 1849, the Habsburg Austrian Empire was threatened by revolutionary movements, which often had a nationalist character. The empire ruled from Vienna included Austrians, Hungarians, Slovenes, Poles, Czechs, Croats, Slovaks, Ukrainians slash Ruthenians, Romanians, Serbs and Italians, all of whom attempted in the course of the revolution to achieve either autonomy, independence or even hegemony over other nationalities. The nationalist picture was further complicated by the simultaneous events in the German states which moved toward greater German national unity. Hungary, painting the Battle of Buda in May 1849 by Mortan, painting Hungarian hussars in battle during the Hungarian Revolution. The Hungarian Revolution of 1848 was the longest in Europe, crushed in August 1849 by Austrian and Russian armies. Nevertheless, it had major effect in freeing the serfs. It started on 15th of March 1848 when Hungarian patriots organised mass demonstrations in Pest and Buda, today Budapest, which forced the imperial governor to accept their 12 points of demands, which included the demand for freedom of press, an independent Hungarian ministry residing in Budapest and responsible to a popularly elected parliament the formation of a national guard, complete civil and religious equality, trial by jury, a national bank, a Hungarian army, the withdrawal of foreign Austrian troops from Hungary, the freeing of political prisoners and the union with Transylvania. On that morning, the demands were read aloud along with poetry by Sandor Petofi, with the simple lines of, We swear by the God of the Hungarians, we swear we shall be slaves no more. Lajos Kossuth and some other liberal nobility that made up the Diet appealed to the Habsburg court with demands for representative government and civil liberties. These events resulted in Clemens von Metternich, the Austrian prince and foreign minister, resigning. The demands of the Diet were agreed upon 18th of March by Emperor Ferdinand. Although Hungary would remain part of the empire through personal union with the emperor, a constitutional government would be founded. The Diet then passed the April laws that established equality before the law, a legislature, a hereditary constitutional monarchy, and an end to the transfer and restrictions of land use. The revolution grew into a war for independence from the Austrian Empire when Josip Jelakic, ban of Croatia crossed the border to restore Habsburg control. The new government, led by Lajos Kusuth, was initially successful against the Habsburg forces, although Hungary took a national united stand for its freedom. Some minorities of the Kingdom of Hungary, including the Serbs of Vojvodina, the Romanians of Transylvania, and some Slovaks of Upper Hungary supported the Habsburg Emperor and fought against the Hungarian Revolutionary Army. Eventually, after one and a half years of fighting, the revolution was crushed when Russian Tsar Nicholas I marched into Hungary with over 300,000 troops. With the Austrian government restored, Hungary was thus placed under brutal martial law. The leading rebels like Kossuth fled into exile or were executed. In the long run, the passive resistance following the revolution led to the Austro-Hungarian Compromise, which marked the birth of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Galicia, the centre of the Ukrainian national movement, was in Galicia, which is today divided between Ukraine and Poland. On 19th of April 1848, a group of representatives led by the Greek Catholic clergy launched a petition to the Austrian Emperor, It expressed wishes that in those regions of Galicia where the Ruthenian, brackets Ukrainian population, represented majority, the Ukrainian language should be taught at schools and used to announce official decrees for the peasantry. Local officials were expected to understand it, and the Ruthenian clergy was to be equalised in their rights with the clergy of all other denominations. On 2nd of May 1848, the Supreme Ruthenian Ukrainian Council 
was established. The Council 1848 to 1851 was headed by the Greek Catholic Bishop Gregory Yakimovich and consisted of 30 permanent members. Its main goal was the administrative division of Galicia into Western, brackets, Polish and Eastern, brackets, Ruthenian slash Ukrainian parts within the borders of the Habsburg Empire and formation of a separate region with a political self-governance. Sweden. During 18th to 19th of March, a series of riots known as the March Unrest took place in the Swedish capital of Stockholm. Declarations with demands of political reform were spread in the city and a crowd was dispersed by military, leading to 18 casualties. Switzerland. Switzerland, already an alliance of republics, also saw an internal struggle. The attempted succession of seven Catholic cantons to form an alliance known as the Sonderbund, separate alliance, in 1848 led to a short civil conflict in November 1847, in which around 100 people were killed. The Sonderbund was decisively defeated by the Protestant cantons, which had a larger population. A new constitution of 1848 ended the almost complete independence of the cantons, transforming Switzerland into a federal state. Greater Poland. Polish people mounted a military insurrection against the Prussians in the Grand Duchy of Posen, or the Greater Poland region, a part of Prussia, since its annexation in 1815. The Poles tried to establish a Polish political entity, but refused to cooperate with the Germans and the Jews. The Germans decided they were better off with the status quo, so they assisted the Prussian governments in recapturing control. In the long term, the uprising stimulated nationalism among both the Poles and the Germans and brought civil equality to the Jews. Romanian Principalities Painting Romanian revolutionaries in Bucharest in 1848 carrying the Romanian tricolour. A Romanian liberal and romantic nationalist uprising began in June in the Principality of Wallachia. Its goals were administrative autonomy, abolition of serfdom and popular self-determination. It was closely connected with the 1848 unsuccessful revolt in Moldavia. It sought to overturn the administration imposed by imperial Russian authorities under the Regulamentul Organic Regime and through many of its leaders demanded the abolition of boyar privilege. Led by a group of young intellectuals and officers in the Wallachian military forces, the movement succeeded in toppling the ruling prince, George Bibescu, whom it replaced with a provisional government and a regency, and in passing a series of major liberal reforms, first announced in the proclamation of Islas. Despite its rapid gains in popular backing, the new administration was marked by conflicts between the radical wing and more conservative forces, especially over the issue of land reform. Two successive abortive coups weakened the new government and its, new, and its international status was always contested by Russia. After managing to rally a, de- a degree of sympathy from Ottoman political leaders, the revolution was ultimately isolated by the intervention of Russian diplomats. In September 1848, by agreement with the Ottomans, Russia invaded and put down the revolution. According to Vasil Makiu, the failures were attributable in Wallachia to foreign intervention, in Moldavia to opposition of the feudalists, and in Transylvania to the failure of the campaigns of General Joseph Bem, and later to Austrian repression. In later decades, the rebels returned and gained their goals. Belgium, painting depiction of Leopold I of Belgium's symbolic offer to resign the crown in 1848. Belgium did not see major unrest in 1848. It had already undergone undergone a liberal reform after the revolution of 1830, and thus its constitutional system and its monarchy survived. A number of small local riots broke out, concentrated in the Ceylon Industrial industrial region of the provinces of Liege and Hainaut. The most serious threat of revolutionary contagion, however, was posed by the Belgian émigré groups from France. 
In 1830, the Belgian Revolution had broken out inspired by the revolution occurring in France, and Belgian authorities feared that a similar copycat phenomenon might occur in 1848. Shortly after the revolution in France, Belgian migrant workers living in Paris were encouraged to return to Belgium to overthrow the monarchy and establish a republic. Belgian authorities expelled Karl Marx himself from Brussels in early March on accusations of having used part of his inheritance to arm Belgian revolutionaries. Around 6,000 armed émigrés of the Belgian Legion attempted to cross the Belgian frontier. There were two divisions which were formed. The first group, travelling by train, were stopped and quickly disarmed at Quivrain, on 26 March 1848, the second group crossed the border on 29th of March and headed for Brussels. They were confronted by Belgian troops at the hamlet of Risquons II and defeated. Several smaller groups managed to infiltrate Belgium, but the reinforced Belgian border troops succeeded and, def- and the defeat at Risquons II effectively ended the revolutionary threat to Belgium. The situation in Belgium began to recover that summer after a good harvest and fresh elections, returned a strong majority to the governing party. Ireland. A tendency common in the revolutionary movements of 1848 was a perception that the liberal monarchies set up in the 1830s, despite formally being representative parliamentary democracies, were too oligarchical and or corrupt to respond to the urgent needs of the people and were therefore in need of drastic democratic overhaul or, failing that, separatism to build a democratic state from scratch. This was the process that occurred in Ireland between 1801 and 1848. Previously, a separate kingdom, Ireland was incorporated into the United Kingdom in 1801. Although its population was made up largely of Catholics and sociologically of agricultural workers, Tensions arose from the political over-representation in positions of power of landowners of Protestant background who were loyal to the United Kingdom. From the 1810s, a conservative liberal movement led by Daniel O'Connell had sought to secure equal political rights for Catholics within the British political system. Successful in the Roman Catholic Relief Act, 1829, but as in other European states, a current inspired by radicalism, criticised the conservative liberals for pursuing the aim of democratic equality with excessive compromise and gradualism. Painting Trial of the Irish Patriots at Clonmel, Young Irelanders Receiving Their Sentence of Death. In Ireland, a current of nationalist, egalitarian and radical republicanism inspired by the French Revolution had been present since the 1790s, being expressed initially in the Irish Rebellion of 1798. This tendency grew into a movement for social, cultural and political reform during the 1830s. In 1839 was realised into a political association called Young Ireland, It was initially not well received, but grew more popular with the Great Famine of 1845 to 1849, an event that brought catastrophic social events and which threw into light the inadequate responses of authorities. The spark for the Young Islander Revolution came in 1848 when the British Parliament passed the Crime and Outrage Bill, The bill was essentially a declaration of martial law in Ireland, designed to create a counterinsurgency against the growing Irish nationalist movement. In response, the Young Ireland Party launched its rebellion in July 1848, gathering landlords and tenants to its cause. But its first major engagement against police in the village of Ballingarry, South Tipperary, was a failure. A long gunfight with around 50 armed Royal Irish constables ended when police reinforcements arrived. After the arrest of the Young Ireland leaders, the rebellion collapsed through intermittent fighting, though intermittent fighting continued for the next year. It is sometimes called the Famine Rebellion since it took place during the Great Famine. 
Spain. While no revolution occurred in Spain in the year 1848, a similar phenomenon occurred. During this year, the country was going through the Second Carlist War. The European revolutions erupted at a moment when the political regime in Spain faced great criticism from within one of its two main parties, and by 1854, a radical liberal revolution and conservative liberal counter-revolution had both occurred. Since 1833, Spain had been governed by a con conservative liberal parliamentary monarchy, similar to and modelled on the July monarchy in France. In order to exclude absolute monarchists from government, power had alternated between two liberal parties, the centre-left Progressive Party and the centre-right Moderate Party. But a decade of rule by the centre-right Moderates had recently produced a constitutional reform, 1845, prompting fears that the Moderates sought to reach out to absolutists and permanently exclude the Progressives. The left wing of the Progressive Party, which had historical links to Jacobinism, and radicalism began to push for root and branch reforms to the constitutional monarchy, notably universal male suffrage and parliamentary sovereignty. The European revolutions of 1848 and particularly the French Second Republic prompted the Spanish radical movement to adopt positions incompatible with the existing constitutional regime, notably republicanism. This ultimately led to the radicals exiting the Progressive Party to form the Democratic Party in 1849. Over the next years, two revolutions occurred. In 1852, the Conservatives of the Moderate Party were ousted after a decade in power by an alliance of radicals, liberals and liberal conservatives, led by Generals Espartero and O'Donnell. In 1854, the more conservative half of this alliance launched a second revolution to oust the Republican radicals, leading to a new 10-year period of government by conservative liberal monarchists. Taken together, the two revolutions can be thought of as echoing aspects of the French Second Republic, the Spanish Revolution of 1852 as a revolt by radicals and liberals against the oligarchical conservative liberal parliamentary monarchy of the 1830s mirrored the French Revolution of 1848, while the Spanish Revolution of 1854 as a counter-revolution of conservative liberals under a military strongman had echoes of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte's coup against the French Second Republic. Other European states. Illustration of the March Troubles in Stockholm, Sweden in 1848. The island of Great Britain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Portugal, the Russian Empire, including Poland and Finland and the Ottoman Empire, did not encounter major national or radical revolutions over this period. Sweden and Norway were also little affected. Serbia, though formally unaffected by the revolt, as it was a part of the Ottoman state, actively supported Serbian revolutionaries in the Habsburg Empire. Russia's relative stability was attributed to the revolutionaries' groups' inability to communicate with each other. In some countries, uprisings had already occurred, demanding similar reforms to the revolutions of 1848, but little success. This was the case for the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which had seen a series of uprisings before or after, but not during 1848. The November Uprising of 1830-31, to 31, the Krakow Uprising of 1846, notable for being quelled by the anti-revolutionary Galician slaughter, and later on the January Uprising of 1863-65. to 65. In other countries, the relative calm could be attributable to the fact that they had already gone through revolutions or civil wars in the preceding years and therefore already enjoyed many of the reforms which radicals elsewhere were demanding in 1848. This was largely the case for Belgium, the Belgian Revolution in 1830-1, Portugal, the Liberal Wars of 1828-34, and Switzerland, the Sonderbund War of 1847. 
In yet other countries, the absence of unrest was partly due to governments taking action to prevent revolutionary unrest and preemptively grant some of the reforms demanded by revolutionaries elsewhere. This was notably the case for the Netherlands, where King William II decided to alter the Dutch constitution to reform elections and voluntarily reduce the power of the monarchy. The same might be said of Switzerland, where a new constitutional regime was introduced in 1848, the Swiss Federal Constitution, was a revolution of sorts, laying the foundation of Swiss society as it is today. While no major upheavals politically occurred in the Ottoman Empire, as such, political unrest did occur in some of its vassal states. In Serbia, feudalism was abolished and the power of the Serbian prince was reduced with the Turkish Constitution of Serbia in 1838. Other English-speaking countries. Chartists meeting on Kennington Common, 10th of April, 1848. In Britain, while the middle class had been pacified by their inclusion in the extension of the franchise in the Reform Act, 1832, the consequentialist agitations, violence and petitions of the Chartist movement came to a head with their peaceful petition to Parliament of 1848, the repeal in 1846 of the protectionist agricultural tariffs called the Corn Laws had diffused some proletarian fervour. In the Isle of Man, there were ongoing efforts to reform the self-elected House of Keys, but no revolution took place. Some of the reformers were encouraged by events in France in particular. In the United States, opinions were polarised with Democrats and reformers in favour, although they were distressed at the degree of violence involved Opposition came from conservative elements, especially Whigs, Southern slaveholders, Orthodox Calvinists and Catholics. About 4,000 German exiles arrived and some became fervent Republicans in the 1850s, such as Karl Schurz. Kossuth toured America and won great applause, but no volunteers or diplomatic or financial help. Following rebellions in 1837 and 1838, 1848 in Canada saw the establishment of responsible government in Nova Scotia and the Canadas, the first such governments in the British Empire outside Great Britain. John Ralston Saul has argued that this development is tied to the revolutions in Europe, but described the Canadian approach to the revolutionary year of 1848 as taking their way out of, em of the empire's control and into a new democratic model a stable democratic system, which was lasted to the present day. Tory and Orange Order in Canada, opposition to responsible government, came to a head in riots triggered by the Rebellion Losses Bill in 1849. They succeeded in the burning of the Parliament buildings in Montreal, but unlike their counter-revolutionary counterparts in Europe, they were ultimately unsuccessful. South America and Spanish Latin America, the revolution of 1848 appeared in New Granada where Colombian students, liberals and intellectuals demanded the election of General José Hilario López. He took power in 1849 and launched major reforms, abolishing slavery and the death penalty and providing freedom of the press and of religion. The resulting turmoil in Colombia lasted three decades from 1851 to 1885, the country was ravaged by four general civil wars and 50 local revolutions. In Chile, the 1848 revolutions inspired the 1851 Chilean revolution. In Brazil, the Praia Revolt, a movement in Pernambuco, lasted from November 1848 to 1852. Unresolved conflicts from the period of the Regency and local resistance to the consolidation of the Brazilian Empire that had been proclaimed in 1822 helped to plant the seeds of the revolution. In Mexico, the conservative government led by Santa Ana lost Texas, California and half of the territory to the United States in the Mexican-American War of 1845-48. to Derived from this catastrophe and chronic stability problems, the Liberal Party started a reformist movement. This movement via elections led Liberals to formulate the plan of Ayutla, a plan written in 1854 aimed at removing conservative centralist 
President Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna from control of Mexico during the Second Federal Republic of Mexico period. Initially, it seemed little different than other political plans of the era, but it is considered the first act of the liberal reform in Mexico. It was the catalyst for revolts in many parts of Mexico, which led to the resignation of Santa Ana from the presidency, never to vie for office again. The next presidents of Mexico were the liberals, Juan Alvarez, Ignacio Comonfort, and Benito Juarez. The new regime would then proclaim the 1857 Mexican Constitution, which implemented a variety of liberal reforms. Among other things, these reforms confiscated religious property, aimed to promote economic development and to stabilise a nascent Republican movement. The reforms led directly to the so-called Three Years War or Reform War of 1857. The Liberals won this war, but the Conservatives solicited the French government of Napoleon III for a European Conservative monarch, deriving into the Second French Intervention in Mexico under the puppet Habsburg government of Maximilian I of Mexico. The country became a client state of France, 1863 to 1867. Legacy. We have all been beaten and humiliated, scattered, imprisoned, disarmed and gagged. The fate of the European democracy has slipped from our hands. Pierre-Joseph Pradon. Historian Priscilla Smith-Robertson argues that many goals were achieved by the 1870s, but the credit primarily goes to the enemies of the 1848 revolutionaries. Most of what the men of 1848 fought for was brought about within a quarter of a century, and the men who accomplished it were, most of them, specific enemies of the 1848 movement. Tears ushered in a third French Republic, Bismarck, United Germany, and Kavawa, Italy. Deke won autonomy for Hungary within a dual monarchy. A Russian Tsar freed the serfs and the British manufacturing classes moved toward the freedom of the people's charter. Democrats looked to 1848 as a democratic revolution, which in the long run ensured liberty, equality and fraternity. For nationalists, 1848 was the springtime of hope when newly emerging nationalities rejected the old multinational empires. But the end results were not as comprehensive as many had hoped. A caricature by Ferdinand Schroeder on the defeat of the revolutions of 1848-49 in Europe. Many governments engaged in a partial reversal of the revolutionary reforms of 1848 to 49, as well as heightened repression and censorship. The Hanoverian nobility successfully appealed to the Confederal Diet in 1851 over the loss of their noble privileges, while the Prussian junkers recovered the manorial police powers from 1852 to 55. In the Austrian Empire, the Sylvester Patent, 1851, discarded Franz Stadion's constitution and the statute of basic rights, while the number of arrests in Habsburg territories increased from 70,000 in 1850 to 1 million by 1854. Nicholas I's rule in Russia after 1848 was particularly repressive, marked by an expansion of the secret police, the Treaty Odeleni, and stricter censorship. There were more Russians working for censorship organs than actual books published in the period immediately after 1848. In France, the works of Ledru Rollin, Hugo Baudelaire and Pradon were confiscated. In the post-revolutionary decade after 1848, little had visibly changed and many historians consider the revolutions a failure, given the seeming lack of permanent structural changes. More recently, Christopher Clarke has characterised the period that followed 1848 as one that dominated, as one dominated by a revolution in government. Karl Marx expressed disappointment at the bourgeois character of the revolutions. The Prussian Prime Minister Otto von Manteuffel declared that the state could no longer be run like the landed estate of a nobleman. In Prussia, August von Bethmann-Holweg's 
newspaper, founded 1851, acted as a popular outlet for modernising Prussian conservative statesmen and journalists against the reactionary Krizaitum faction. The revolutions of 1848 were followed by new centrist coalitions, dominated by liberals nervous of the threat of working-class socialism, as seen in the Piedmontese Connubio under Cavour. Governments under 1848 were forced into managing the public sphere and popular sphere with more effectiveness, resulting in the increased prominence of the Prussian Zentrastelfur Pressangelenheiten, Central Press Agency, established 1850, the Austrian Censur und Police Hofstel, and the French Direction Generale de la Librairie, 1856. Nevertheless, there were a few immediate successes for some revolutionary movements, notably in the Habsburg lands. Austria and Prussia eliminated feudalism by 1850, improving the lot of the peasants. European middle class made political and economic gains over the next 20 years. France retained universal male suffrage. Russia would later free the serfs on 19th of February 1861. The Habsburgs finally had to give the Hungarians more self-determination in the Ozglitch of 1867. The revolutions inspired lasting reform in Denmark as well as the Netherlands. Reinhard Rurup has described the 1848 revolutions as a turning point in the development of modern anti-Semitism through the development of conspiracies that presented Jews as representative both of the forces of social revolution apparently typified in Joseph Goldmark and Adolf Fischhoff of Vienna and of international capital, as seen in the 1848 report from Eduard von Müller-Tellering, the Viennese correspondent of Marx's New Rheinische Zeitung, which declared, tyranny comes from money and the money belongs to the Jews. About 4,000 exiles came to the United States fleeing the reactionary purges. Of these, 100 went to the Texas Hill Country as German Texans. More widely, many disillusioned and persecuted revolutionaries, in particular, though not exclusively, those from German and the Austrian Empire, left their homeland for foreign exile in the New World or in the more liberal European nations. These emigrants were known as the 48ers. Louis Blenker, Germany, Alexander Schimmelfenig, Germany, Karl Schurz, Germany, Franz Siegel, Germany, August Willich, Germany, Alexander Asboth, Hungary, Lajos Kusus, Hungary, Albin Francisco Schof, Hungary, Julius Stahil, Hungary, Charles Zagoni, Hungary, Thomas Francis Mega, Ireland, Lord Zimierz Krizanowski, Poland. In popular culture, Stephen Brust and Emma Bull's 1997 ep- epistolary novel Freedom and Necess- Necessity is set in England in the aftermath of the revolutions of 1848. So that was the Congress of Vienna and the revolutions of 1848 which followed it. And the next episode is going to be on the French Revolution. Thanks for listening.